The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Anyway, today I want to give you some tools that uh, I think could really help you. Those that are watching by Ustream and particularly in your house groups and everything, if we could eliminate something that I know most of you in this church have eliminated it to a large degree, but you need a refresher and you also need, it's one thing to learn how to receive ministry effectively. It's another thing to turn around and bless somebody and, and, and coach them through ministry, proper ministry. So, um, you, know, you know what? I can't go any further. I have to prophesy to Gianna and Sonia. Would you stand up, please? This is a short one. But I know that I know that what God says is I didn't bring you here by chance, nor was it by curiosity. But God said, because you have a hunger for me and I'm going to satisfy it, this is just one step in the satisfaction of your heart, that you're longing for more. There's a great multitude that are satisfied with the status quo, but you're not in that category, neither one of you. And God says the two of you have come even this as a first step. And there are many steps outside of this church that I am going to lead you in step by step. But granted, I'm going to answer the desires of your heart for more. And you will not be satisfied with the status quo. You will not be satisfied any longer because that hunger and that thirst is something that's building on the inside. And once I give you a taste of an experience, you're going to take that experience and go more. Then you're going to say, I like, I'm motivated now because it's want to, not have to. And he's going to break off any religion, any striving, and he's going to bring you into, in essence, he's going to bring you into uh, a loving, comfortable relationship with God. And something that we teach a great deal of is John 15, how to abide, how to practice the presence of God, how to abide, how to abide. And when you abide in him properly, you abide this way. A lot of people want to skip that step, but you cannot perform true abiding in the word unless it's horizontal and vertical. And God says, this is just the beginning of the first step. And baby steps of obedience build spiritual influence. So get ready for more spiritual influence. You've taken the first step. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, today, I want to cover a tool uh, this is some of the things that we're doing on, on uh, Studio Tuesday. It's covering some tools that you can get proficient at that you could basically minister to anybody. I don't care if they're leaders in the body of Christ or if they're just a newborn believer. At the same time, the basics are the basics. It's a return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. And we've made it too complicated. Almost, a matter of fact, that was the first thing Jennifer did when I showed her how to minister from the heart and how to depend on the Jesus within you rather than depending on someone doing their thing, which is prevalent. Is it not in the church? We're looking for Joe Heavy Speaker to do their thing, and that's fine, but it needs to get to the point where you don't go to the dentist to brush your teeth. All right, we get lazy and then we look for others to do to us what we should be cultivating and developing within ourselves, right? Right. All right, so I want to give you one of those tools, um, and it's basically eliminating self sabotage. I want to give you some elements of truth, and actually, truth, I only interpret truth one way reality. I want the real Jesus in the reality. I don't want facts. I don't want information about him. I want him. And that's reality. So I'm going to give you seven elements of reality that are necessary to eliminate self-sabotage. Now, I've been using an illustration and wasn't sure where it came from. So I looked it up today and it was very interesting where it came from. The carrot and the stick. Have you ever heard that expression? The carrot and the stick? Oh, some yes, some no. Okay. Well, anyway, the carrot and the stick was uh, the, the one origin of that little story has to do with a stubborn mule. Of course, that couldn't apply to church at all, any stubbornness. I want to guide you. Don't let me guide you with a bit and bridle, but with mine eye. 
That would be the easy way. But anyway, uh, you a stick with a carrot, which is the reward, and you hold it in front of a stubborn donkey, and he keeps going at it, which is actually quite... That's terrible. Because he never gets it. <laughs> oh, maybe at the end. But he doesn't want to... But he'll keep going after it. Gee, it sounds like an addiction to me. All right, it sounds like... But anyway, that's the one illustration, but that's not the illustration I've used. And, uh, and I found out that uh, Winston Churchill used it in the way that I used it. And so, of course, that's got to be right then. Winston Churchill said it. And that was the carrot and a stick is a reward and punishment. You, you get the carrot or you get the stick. All right? Reward and punishment. But to remove self-sabotage from the average believer... We've got to get to the place where you quit shooting yourself in the foot. My entire ministry, oh, they, they like to say inner healing, but that's the farthest thing from the truth because that just happens to be super easy. <laughs> but what really, it was removing the blockages so that people's purpose can be fulfilled in God because they shoot themselves in the foot. It's like they've got all these gifts and talents and then there's this thing that they sabotage themselves. Uh, you can blame other people, and they will. And blame the devil. But in reality, a lot of times, it's you. <laughs> huh? And some people are always, I'm, I'm doing spiritual warfare. You're battling with your own carnality. All right? The devil doesn't have to bother you. You beat yourself up enough just with your, with your unresolved issues. Huh? Is that possible? I mean, just saying, right? That's what, isn't that what you say? Just saying? When you say something hard, then you say, just saying, you know. That gets you off the hook. Uh, I learned this stuff in the South. I'm telling you what. Bless your heart. That means you just really did something stupid, and you're blessing them rather than criticizing them. Well, I guess that's kind of a good thing. All right. Jennifer's going to argue with me on that one. She's a Southern girl, true and true. But anyway, the carrot and the stick. Uh, and um, there's a couple instances where it was used by a speech with Winston Churchill, also in the Maltese Falcon. How many ever saw that old movie? Yeah. It was also used there, so Humphrey Bogart, it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. <laughs> but it infers that the animal was tempted with a carrot and then beaten with a stick. Uh, Mr. Churchill said it in a press conference in 1943, we shall continue to operate on the Italian donkey at both ends, with a carrot and with a stick, okay? But in my context, it's basically coming across as self-righteousness. So I want to cover that today. I want you to uh, eliminate self-sabotage. Uh, the, the problem was in the beginning is that Flesh may like the thought of serving and loving God, but on its own terms. Let that sink in for a minute. Flesh might, in other words, it's easy to get religious, but when you're religious, you serve God based on not conviction or even covenant in a lot of cases. You serve based on convenience. You serve on my terms as opposed to God terms. If you're a note taker, write that down. Serving God on my terms versus God's terms. And that's very easy to do. You deal with what's comfortable and you dismiss anything that's uncomfortable. And you serve a God of convenience. Well, he's a God of conviction and a God of command and you need to know the difference. And in many cases, it could be separating you from God. And there, there's a key word there. That's the beginning of the, uh, of the problem. Uh, element number one of seven elements of how to break <coughs> self-sabotage is understanding where did this problem get started. And it's a problem of separation. We know that happened in the garden, right? Sin entered, man was separated from God. But we also see that historically the name Pharisee meant separatists or the separated ones. They were also known as people who were loyal to God, loved God, 
And they made themselves bitter and deadly opponents to Jesus and his message. Well, what went wrong? They were dedicated, separated unto God. They were loyal to God. And this is something that will shoot you in the foot if you get into this. And that is you can have all of these convictions of how loyal you are to God. You may even go to church, <laughs> which is a novelty nowadays, for Christians. And you may even go to church, but basically it's on your own terms, not God's terms. You don't really get before the Lord and say, what do you want? You basically do what is convenient. But anyway, with all of their religion, uh, and, and I, I believe they meant to serve God, don't you? I don't think they went into this not saying I'm going to intentionally miss God in my quest for God. Huh? But they became so devoted and extremist to the law and a very limited portion of the law, and they themselves added to them to the point that they became blind to the Messiah when he appeared. Isn't that something? Can you be so dedicated and so consecrated and yet blind to the reality? See, for me, truth and reality are synonymous. And I like to say reality more than truth because people uh, equate truth with just facts. You know, and it's so much more than that. To see the truth of the cross is far superior to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. Yes, he died on the cross, but the reality of that death on the cross is far more important than just a mere fact. All right? Now, when Jesus addressed them, he said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness, this is addressing the people. These are the people that he came, died for, and loved. And he loved those Pharisees too, but this is what he said. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're never going to enter the kingdom of God. Can you imagine telling that these are people who devoted their lives to the law of God and missed it? They served God on their own terms. In a sense, somewhere along the line, they served God on their own terms because they even, they even added to the law to their own liking. Oh, that's kind of like according to their own terms. They served according to their terms. Interesting. To me, that's a good word for all script, for all uh, Christians. Uh, and in John 5.39, here is the key element. It says, you search the scriptures. And I've had friends that I swear they made the Bible the third person of the Trinity. Ink on a page. No. Jesus is the living word. It's not just a doctrine. It's, it's not facts and in ink on a page. It's the reality of a person. And it says, Jesus himself said, you search the scriptures. Isn't that what they prided themselves in, being knowledgeable? I already know that. Hmm? You search the scriptures because they point to me and yet you won't come to me. Therein lies the problem of self-sabotage. You want to destroy yourself, you can do it in the church just as easy as you can do it outside of the church. It's a heart matter. It's a matter of the heart. And God's basically saying that, you know, there's good separation, there's bad separation. Sanctification means to be separate unto God. But they made ordinances for themselves, religious rules for self. If self, can't, if self can actually do it, it's not God as far as I'm concerned. Then you wouldn't need God if self can do it, right? So you make up your own rules, you make up your own reserva uh, uh, religious ordinances, and you separate yourself to God. Make up your own rules. I've seen people basically all of a sudden go, I got to get right with God. And so they do some action rather than conditioning the heart. Ah, I'm throwing the TV out. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And then later on they change their mind. They buy the TV, have to buy another one, get it back because they threw the other one out uh, kind of rashly. They were going to get holy. <laughs> But it was in self-effort. And too much, all of self-sabotage is the carrot and the stick. When you are the one who rewards yourself or punishes yourself, it's nothing to do with God. It's just dead religion. 
and you become God in your own life or self-righteousness. <laughs> I had a whole list of, of things that were written that sounds a little bit like that uh, comedian. You might be a Pharisee if <laughs> you're glad that you're better than others. <laughs> you, you might be a, a Pharisee if your sins seem so small when placed besides the really big sins of other people. Thank God I'm not as bad as them, right? I used to see that in men's groups. Sometimes they wouldn't really open up, repent, and get clean. They would open up and compare themselves. Well, thank God I'm not as bad as Harry. I mean, he's really, he's in really bad shape. I'm in good shape. Abraham, Harry, okay. <laughs> uh, every time I use an example, there's always someone in the room with that name. <laughs> One time I thought I was safe. I used to use a, a, a term, the De Julia girl. I said, you know, like the, your next door neighbor, like the, the one that lives next to the De Julia girl. Wouldn't you know I had a visiting family and that were the De Julias? And they were horrified. <laughs> so I can't even use Smith. We've got Smith in here. We've got, I'm in trouble any way you look at it. Better off using me. You might be a Pharisee if you verbally rip apart the people who disagree with you. Whoa. Didn't, didn't those Pharisees gnash with their teeth? I wonder what that sounded like. Probably not very pleasant. <laughs> they gnashed with their teeth. Jesus, Jesus was messing with them. He was pushing their buttons, and so they, they gnashed with their teeth. Anyway, I have to look that one up. <laughs> you might be a Pharisee if you're obsessed with externals but blind to the internal reality of your own need. That's something we flip-flop in this church, isn't it? You can have all the externals. Remember when we used to ask people, uh, for the, the God's going to search your heart. Will you let God search your heart? Yeah, we'll let, I'll let God search my heart. Come on. Okay, God, search my heart for anything that's bad and it's in the way. And they go, okay, who's the first person in our situation? My mother. What's the emotion? I love my mother. I thought we were searching for any anxious thoughts or hurtful ways. They wanted to express their virtue. That's religion. That's religion. You're giving the right answer. Trust me, if you've been in the church five years, you ought to be able to give the right answer. If you've read your Bible, you should know the right answers. But he is the answer, and you need that reality. All right? Um, I'm going to skip. i got a list of 60 you might be a Pharisee if and you're, I'm, not, I'm not giving them to you. You're going to have to ask, Holy Spirit, search me, oh God, if there's any Pharisaical ways in me, and trust me, we've all got stuff to deal with. Mm -mm. I doubt if any of us are immune, except the person who is, I'm complicated. That might be good for you, but I don't have those kinds of issues. That's for other people. All right. Element number two. And this is something that I think we all need. This is a, this is a good wake-up call for believers. And I know you people are well-trained. I know you're mature. And I'm very proud of you because we have a healthy church. Everybody's got their stuff, but in the small groups, everybody knows how to deal with it. And I've seen them play shepherd, sheep, sheep, shepherd. You know what that is? That's the way Jennifer and I ministered each other. If I had something I wanted to pray it through, Jennifer, just she'd kind of coach me through it, and vice versa. We would switch back and forth. All of our groups have that capacity, and you're very fortunate if you attend a small group. And if you don't, there's sign-up sheets right out in the hallway. So you're without excuse. You're missing out on something really good. Now, element number two, Jeremiah 12, verses 1 and 2. He questioned the prosperity of the wicked. Where is God who is in their mouth, but their heart is far away? Could God be in their mouth and their heart be far away? With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. But they were prospering. This irritated Jeremiah. Or if it didn't irritate him, he certainly wanted to inquire of the Lord what's going on here. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever seen people prosper that you knew were not walking the walk? Hmm? That's more of a test for you. That's a test for you because it says, let me plead and reason my case with you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? 
Why are they all at ease and thriving who deal very treacherously and deceitfully? You have planted them, yes. They've taken root. They grow. They bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouths, but you are far away from their heart. The prosperity of the wicked is a common theme in Scripture. God is in control and needs to be in control of the life of the believer. That's a fact. Because if you get sidetracked with the prosperity of the wicked, it's, it's working to where you will shoot yourself in the foot. Blame God. Get mad at God. Say, why bother? But Jeremiah 12 the uncompromisingly righteous and rigidly just are you, O Lord. So I'm complaining to you, God, because I'm seeing wicked people prosper. It's bothering me. It's pushing my button. My answer would be, it's your button. Now you can see what's in your heart. Can't you? What do you care about what's happening over there? Because you know what? David had the same, the same thought, but he says, David said, God, why, why do the wicked prosper? But then he said, then I considered their end. Ah, see, here is a key. The key is basically the lack of covenant relationship in the church because people like David had a long-term plan in his covenant arrangement. He, he wanted a relationship with God that lasted so he could say, here's what I'm going through now. Here's what has happened, but here's what is yet to come. There's always, there's hope in the end. I know the plan that he has for me, welfare, not calamity, even in the midst of calamity. You have to be able to think beyond the current because the trap for the believer is just what we started with. Serving and loving God on my own terms, my own soulish terms, based on my likes and dislikes. You want to sabotage discernment, you'll go by likes and dislikes. Likes and dislikes is not discernment. Discernment is the condition and the source of God himself. Where is God in this? Not your likes and dislikes. Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Apparently, that's a major temptation for the righteous, isn't it? Look at what they're getting away with. But you know, here's the beautiful part. You mess up on a regular basis, and you've got the blood of Jesus to redeem you. And it's like, you, you, you get knocked down, boom, you get back up. You get knocked down again, boom, you get back up. You get knocked down again, boom. You get the, the, the wicked, when they're down, they are down eternally and for the count. There's no getting up. Consider the end before you, before you ever allow the prosperity of the wicked to tempt you to come out of that safe, secure place of righteousness in God. All right? So that's element number two, that the... the the test, matter of fact, Psalm 73, 3 says the same thing. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So let's pray right now. That that's not a temptation for us. You don't be looking to other people for your purpose or for success or for death. Comparing yourself among yourself is foolishness, right? So Father, right now, looking at other people's apparent sex, success or failure. You know what? There's some successful people in the news that are committing suicide. I don't think that's very successful. So, Father, right now, we just uh, cleanse us from any temptation to be looking at other people's situation and wondering why are they getting their life so easy and, and they seem to be flourishing and mine is going through some hard places because though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. They don't have that option. You should be pleading and interceding for them because they're in the deception of their own prosperity. They're in the deception that they can do whatever they want apart from God. There is a way that seems right to them, but the end is destruction. You should be interceding for them instead of being jealous of them. God wants you to basically learn that the problem in the beginning was element number one, 
serving and loving God on my own terms. Whether I go to church or don't go to church, whether I have fellowship or don't have fellowship, whether I do this or whether I do that, it's all up to me. That's the downward spiral. And you'll miss the provision that God has for you, even if it's right in front of your face. How many remember that scripture, Ezekiel 14.4? Raise your hand if you even remember that from that message. Three people. Okay. Ezekiel 14.4 is, If a person comes to the prophet with an idol in his heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol. That can mean two things. One, you're not going to hear. Or two, you're going to hear it and twist it with your own lustful, idolatrous heart. You can do that. You have the capacity, don't you? Can't you take a prophetic word and twist it and make it what you want? Yep. He that comes to the prophet with an idol in his heart, idols in his heart, I will answer him according to the idols in the heart. I want to hear God's pure word. I want his clean word. I want his righteous word. So I want to be delivered from the carrot and the stick. I like it even in, in 2 Samuel, the third element is we need to be delivered from the carrot and the stick. And what does that mean, in essence? I am not in charge of my life. I don't reward me with an easy this or don't do this, do this. I, I don't reward myself with what's comfortable or convenient. I basically take small baby steps of obedience that build spiritual influence. And so element number three is I definitely need deliverance. You need deliverance. We all need deliverance from the carrot and the stick. David basically said, I'm in great distress. Please let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hands of man. And that includes you. <laughs> you are harder on yourself than God ever was. And one of the best illustrations I've ever heard over the years was David Wilkerson got convicted when the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, David, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. But David, you're making it straighter and narrower than I ever did. Who did that? David, you, self. Self can actually get so religious you make it harder then God would ever make it. God says, I'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If it's, a, if it's a really a hard drudgery life, there's something in you that needs to go. There's some self-sabotage there. There's something you're doing that's making it so miserable. You need a supernatural exchange. I like the Brother Lawrence's uh, response when he blew it. Mm. No matter how he blew it. Let's see how many of you do this. When he blows, I just go, left to myself. It could have been worse. <laughs> if God, you don't help me, if I'm not living by the Spirit, if the Spirit's not helping me, I'm surprised it wasn't worse. When I look at people and they're still shocked at how unbelievers are acting out there, I'm shocked they're not worse, knowing they're under the prince of the power of the air, doing his will. That's what Ephesians says, they're doing his will. I'm surprised they're not worse. I'm pleasantly surprised when an unsaved person is nice. I'm going, wow, that's the common grace that's on planet Earth. What a blessing. Well, if we took the Holy Spirit off this Earth, we'd really see what they'd be like. Okay, so God's looking for a supernatural exchange, loving training from a loving Father. And I guess here's in element number three, needing to be delivered from the carrot and the stick. Here's another way of saying the same thing. I put it on Facebook even. It really hit me. Um, the orphan spirit or Christians that have never really found where they live, what they do for a living, basically disoriented. Do you know if you, if you hit your head and you went to the emergency room and they said, what... Who are you? Where do you live? What do you do for a living? You can't answer that. You're staying. Huh? I say in the kingdom of God, you could ask that same question and confuse a lot of Christians. Who are you? Or better yet, who do you say he is? <laughs> huh? Where do you live? Oh, around. What do you do for a living in the kingdom? How are you serving and obeying God? 
and they, they really can't answer that. An orphan spirit, and this is okay because we, we, we clean the church out regularly. If you, <laughs> all right. But it's usually an orphan spirit that needs healed. But instead, you know what they do? They leave. An orphan spirit will take correction as rejection. Think about that. Matter of fact, even when I'm raising up leadership, the first thing I look for is to see how do they respond when you tell them no? Shouldn't a little child learn no? Shouldn't you have learned that in kindergarten before then? How do you respond when you're corrected? Because a son or a daughter receives it as acceptance. I'm loved enough to be told the truth. And somebody's looking out for me whether I liked it or not. I'm talking loving correction, yeah. But still, the point is, the orphan spirit is so prevalent in the church, any correction, they run. And they take it as rejection. And that's saying there's some, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because I'll tell you what, you give me somebody that'll, that'll, that'll give me criticism or correction, you look for the truth in it, I'll tell you what, that person loves you. Because there's enough people pleasing, there's even people pleasing churches. If you go there, you'll feel comfortable, get, get lost in a crowd. Uh, that way no one can ever offend you or correct you or call you to account on, on any situation. There's plenty of that that can flourish. I want to kick them out <laughs> in a loving way. <laughs> well, didn't Jesus do it in a loving way? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, whoa, that cleared, that cleared out a bunch of them. He wasn't trying to see how many he could get. What was he looking for? And this is what we're looking for. And these two girls right here, you're here. That's the first step of the solution to that question. Is God's looking for hungry people that want more. Not looking for babies to be babysat. Not someone to just be patted on the back and say, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. But to be delivered from the carrot and the stick, we've got to be delivered from that orphan spirit. That, in, that takes anything that sounds like it might be difficult. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want that. Uh, there's got to be an easier way. Well, there's only the easiest way I know is Jesus. And prompt obedience is even easier <laughs> than the other structures of training. Now, a son or a daughter receives it as acceptance. Now, maybe, maybe I'm a little strange in this whole thing, but I'll tell you what, I don't regret one minute of it. When I was a baby Christian, I sought out people who knew more than me in the spirit, not just knew in their head. I needed that, too. But, and I loved it because they thought different than I was thinking, and eventually it changes your thinking. I say, even in this church, there's nothing a person outside of this church would benefit from is hanging out with some of you. If they hang out with some of you, they're going to find out that there's a thinking that's a little different. Like Christy, it's almost awkward because you go, oh my goodness, I could help them. Yeah, I know what they're saying. I know what they're doing. That doesn't really work, but they don't know that yet because that's the only thing they know. <laughs> and then you have to find loving, tactful ways <laughs> to say, let's try it this way. But you know what I used to do with the person that used to go, I love my mother. I don't need anything. I do everything right. We say, well, let's just go a little bit deeper on that mother thing. Let's see if we can't love her a little bit more. What's, what feeling do you feel when you think about your mom? Well, actually, <laughs> that's what we were looking for in the first place while you were busy loving your mother. Okay. Don't we play religious games, though? Put on a religious face? Isn't that historically the truth? Well, let's just get real. real reality means none of us have arrived and we all need more Jesus. Okay? So... Element number four. I hope you're getting these elements. I'm going to go for it. Those note takers get so frustrated. All my C temperaments. He said four and I didn't get three. And <laughs> they need to come forward and get ministry. Let it go. Lighten up. Lighten up, Pharisees. <laughs> okay. It's like, come on. Okay. But let me, just for the sake of seeing a pattern here, is... The 
element number one or the beginning of the problem is doing it your own way. At your, I will serve and love God on my terms. Okay? Element, and the Pharisees did that and missed Jesus. All right? Element number two is a tactic that works on Christians quite well, apparently, all through Scripture. Why do the wicked prosper? If you start getting that in your craw, it's going to sabotage your own Christian walk. Compare yourself to Jesus, not other people. <laughs> Element number three, this reward and punishment, carrot and the stick, means we're still in control. We need delivered from the carrot and stick. There's too many solid Christians that could be extremely beneficial in the body, but they're so busy condemning themselves and beating themselves with the stick. And then when they feel bad, then they reward themselves with something sinful. My case, it'll be donuts. <laughs> At least I know how I reward and punish myself. Deliverance from the carrot and the stick or reward and punishing yourself. That's playing God. That's not God. That's you. You playing God. Element number four, coming into the loving training of a father. I believe you people are healthy enough that you've known what it is to have that intrinsic value, that internal value that I am loved and I am deeply loved of the father and I'm a son. I'm not an orphan. I don't run and hide. I don't interpret everything as rejection. All correction is not rejection. I could actually learn from it. And it's so beneficial because I knew, I sat with pastors for 20 some years, even before I was pastoring, I met weekly with them. They liked me. And so, <laughs> but I liked being with them, but by, by golly, I got corrected regularly in my thinking. And it was a good thing because I knew they loved me and actually saved me a lot of aggravation later in life, having learned from people that had been there and done it. Every single week, for 20-some years, I sat with pastors, even after, before I was a pastor and while I was a pastor. But I'll tell you what I gleaned from them. All the, uh, Dennis, here's one thing you do. I learned what not to do. That in itself, wouldn't that save you? Some heartache if you just learn what not to do? But if you don't know that somebody loves you enough to correct you, if you run from correction, you're an orphan. And you fail, the, you, you miss out on the, on the love that God has for you. I know there's plenty of churches, they will never mention correction. They only give you the promise box. I'm saying you're not balanced until you have the little promise box, all the promises, and you can, you can quote all those. But I want the commandment box that when you pull it up. Or how about put this on the refrigerator for the little kids. The eye of the child that mocks his father. The ravens of the field will pick out his eye. How many have that on the refrigerator? Probably nobody. We just, we, we just ignore those parts of the scripture. That's, that's what you do, right? Right. <laughs> but the fourth element is loving training of the father for sons. Listen to Hebrews 12. Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That needs to be more than a mental concept. That needs to be the way we interact with people and not be afraid. He scourges every son in whom he receives. If you endure the chast chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father is, did not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have all become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we've had many humans, fathers, who corrected us, and we paid them respect. How many shall not much more respect the God who is purely love, purely holy, not dysfunctional? Matter of fact, if you're dysfunctional, you did that all by yourself. Nobody did that to you. That was your response to the world around you, good or bad. God wants to train up believers to respond. Now, there's levels in training. And if you're going to accept internal transformation, 
according to Hebrews, there's three levels. First, there's instruction. That's the easy way. Take that one. Whatever, the, whatever God says to do, do that one. Because the second way is if you don't do that, there's rebuke. And the third level of love is if rebuke doesn't work, there's a consequence. Do you know that even sending someone to jail is an act of love? Sure it is. There's paradise love like in heaven where everything is all there. We live in kind of reconciling love, repentance and forgiveness. But then there's legal love that's oftentimes required. I remember a friend of mine, Sandy uh, Colcon, was basically saying one of the diff most difficult things he had in relating to other business, uh, businesses were having Christians working for him and Christians actually believing that they shouldn't be fired because they're a Christian. That's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's kind of religious. Kind of. But God's basically saying, and I believe he's doing this with some of them, in, in his training right now, don't get hung up on the prosperity of the wicked. Don't, don't let that work on you because in the end, they're down for the count. Though a righteous man fall, he gets back up. But this is something that I use to help restore people, and it, 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 it was, to me, so invaluable. A very simple principle found in Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He says, I will allure her, I will bring her into the wilderness, I will speak comfort to her, I will give her vineyards, and there the valley of trouble will become a door of hope. I've actually walked people through that in a short period of time and saw them, look at this isolation is not for punishment. This isolation is for you to take advantage of intimacy with God. He's there, he wants, he's not isolating you and keeping you from things. He's basically put you in a place to where he wants to minister more effectively. He literally drew you there with cords of love. He allured you into the place of the wilderness not to punish you, that's the religion. I want to get punished, carrot and a stick. I'm not bringing you there to punish you. I'm there. I'm going to start speaking to you comfort. And I'm going to comfort you even from the affliction. And we're called to do that as well. You know that? Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you've been comforted during your time. Of course, if you've never been comforted by the power of the Holy Spirit, if there's never been a supernatural exchange, you can't give something you don't have, can you? You can't really comfort somebody by just patting them on the back. The comfort is going to have to be the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't really learned to triumph over circumstances and enter into the peace of God, even in your wilderness experience, then you really don't have anything to offer anybody else. It's kind of a sad case there. But God's basically saying, I'm going to speak comfort to you. And even this, I've even restored uh, fallen leaders. And one of the things that you need to do is you don't just sit them down and do nothing. You give them something to do. And that's kind of a hard concept for some people. But you know, basically what he said here was that I will give her vineyards from there. I'm going to bring her into a place of isolation. I'm going to speak comfort to her. I'm going to restore her. I'm going to have loving restoration for the wounds and the, and the, and the damage that was done. And, but in this, I'm going to give something to do that they feel productive and that they're accomplishing something. I'm going to give them vineyards, give them something to do. And in that something to do, you're going to come out on the other side that your, your trouble is a door of hope. Do you know almost everything that I've ministered effectively to somebody else came out of my own ministry to me. Ministered to a lot of people that suffered with rejection, but that was like, that was my name tag. And when God ministered acceptance to me supernaturally over a period of time, that acceptance got to be your strongest anointing. Your door of trouble could be your strongest anointing if you deal with it properly through a supernatural exchange of letting God deal with it. It could be your strongest anointing. That thing that's hammered you away for years, that same old, same old, that thing that keeps coming up could be your strongest anointing if you would deal with it. Or you can keep going around the mountain. Do you know most of the church understands sanctification that way, unfortunately? In other words, you go around the mountain enough times. 
If that woman would have said, I love my mother, and would have said, I have bitterness toward my mother, and I release that, that would have been a lot easier than having a woman boss for the next 20 years. That was just like my mother. You ever heard people say, you're just like my father, just like, you know what? Eventually, you might deal with it, but that's the hard way. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. I would rather take the shortcut, wouldn't you? And that shortcut's called prompt obedience. C-Y-O. Put that in your Bible somewhere. C-Y-O. Consent. That only starts here momentarily. Consent, yield, and then obey. It's a co-laboring then of obedience because you're, obe you're obeying from the heart, not the head. Consent, yield, obey. You see where that's coming from? Not consent, yield, and, 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 yield and obey. And, and try harder. That's called striving. I will allure her. I'll bring her into the wilderness. I'll comfort her. I'll give her something to do. And her door of trouble will be a door of hope. Now, there's two words in the scriptures that pertain to teach. To instruct, to direct, to teach, to point, to aim, to show, to throw, to cast in a straight manner. The primary meaning is to shoot straight or direct the flow. I like that direct the flow. Because what I learned in the spirit was to walk in the spirit. This is not too complicated. This is actually simple, but you have to do it. How about that scripture? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. Well, that's nice to say that. Do you know how to do that? Here's the way you would do that. Trust is your yielding. I consent to trust, but I yield or you don't trust. I yield to Jesus in me. And then out of that peace, I obey. But it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. There's a, a built-in warning here so you don't sabotage yourself. Lean not on your understanding, but, or rather, acknowledge. Here's where you acknowledge. You don't acknowledge here. You acknowledge here. You lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge means I acknowledge through divine intimate connection I acknowledge him and he will direct my path. That's what it means to be led by the spirit, to be led by the heart, from the heart, out of the heart flow the issues of life. As a man thinketh not in his head, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. Now, when you start learning to function from the heart, from the gut, from the belly, you begin to follow that that the way God wants to teach you, you need to know that what he wants to teach you, you have an anointing that abides within, he wants to guide you by the Spirit. Pay attention to your gut. Don't override your peace or the rule of God. But there's a second one. It's a different word that means teach, and it means to instruct, train, prod, goad, teach, and it actually used the example of a cattle prod. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, wouldn't you like to get one of those for the kids sometime? <laughs> Come on, really. <laughs> Instead of saying, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> they will learn quick. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer was my favorite when she, she raised a, a teenager as a single parent. She goes, I'm going to count to one. <laughs> And it worked. It really worked. And if, and if this teenager started to push, and you'd feel it in the spirit, you can feel when somebody's pushing in the spirit, can't you? They don't even have to say anything. Well, she could do that as a teenager. And Jennifer's answer was, yeah. And I, I would basically discern it and, tell, and, and feel the push before she would even talk. And I'd say, Allison? If you ask your mother something with that push, the answer is going to be automatically no. Boy, she, let it, she knew how to let it go. She wasn't even really hard after God, but she knew how to let something go from the gut. And I'd feel it, and I'd say, what is it? What do you want, honey? And she goes, I, want, I need a ride to the mall. See, when someone's not pushing, isn't it easier to comply? Huh? If you push, uh, I used to add something to that. What did you used to say? 
if you push me, the answer is automatically no, even if I would have said yes into a D temperament. You just don't. That's like, I lose. Mm -hmm. That's not a good deal. <laughs> All right. But God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. That's the fourth element. The fifth element that we need to understand, we're going to pray this right now. The fifth element is flesh can't fix it. You know, and we've taught this for years and years and years, and we will continue to teach it because people still have a tendency to be man-searched. I want to be God-searched. It's the most proficient and perfect way that you could have anything. It was good enough for them in the Bible. It's good enough for me. I don't want an expert searching me. I don't care how well, how many degrees they've got. I want the Holy Spirit to search my heart, just like it says in the Bible. Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14. David basically said, Who can discern his lapses and his errors? Clear me from hidden and unconscious faults. Well, if they're unconscious faults and they're secret, who are they secret from? You. That means you don't know. Oh, can you imagine that? There'd be something you didn't know. That's an eye-opener, because I'm used to figuring everything out myself. I can do that. Hmm? Here's something you can't do. It's search the 800, how many, 800 billion, 400 billion. I just exaggerated, speaking evangelistically. 400 billion non-conscious thoughts every second. You're not that smart. Consciously, you have about 2,000 going at any given moment. Now, would you trust that 2,000 when God could search the 400 billion? I, 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 do you agree with David? Who can discern his lapses and his errors? Keep me from hidden and unconscious faults or secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin so that they won't have dominion over me. That's very wise. Then I will be blameless, and I will be guiltless of great transgression. In other words, deal with those little foxes. Search me, O oh God. I'm not afraid to be, have my heart searched. I'm not going to be one of those people going, I, I don't need anything. That's for other people. I'm okay. <laughs> those are usually the most messed up people. In case you've said that before, I forgive you. <laughs> you have to forgive me. <laughs> people say that all the time. But in reality, nobody knows themselves like, the, like the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. Let him. He's the one that can do it. The spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of the belly. One translation says a flashlight. You know what a flashlight does in a dark room? It shows you stuff that was always there. You just didn't see it when the light wasn't on. You need God to search your heart. So don't say, I can't think of anything. That's from here up. Who cares about those 2,000 thought patterns of yours? <laughs> up here, you're clueless. <laughs> Admit it. Self can't fix it. We need God. That's the fifth element. Keep me from presumptuous sin because it'll keep you from... You know, when, when people have fallen into great sin, it didn't happen all at once. It was the little foxes that were never properly dealt with because they were okay. I'm okay. I'm a leader. I'm okay. Yeah. I don't, you know what we ran into when we traveled? I had leaders who have nobody to talk to. That's hard. But you better find somebody. Hmm? We prayed for a lot of people that you saw later on in Charisma Magazine. Healed and restored. But they go through hard times and they need, they need to apply themselves for restoration and healing at any level. But our need is to seek and not assume. It says, you will seek me and find me when you require me as your vital necessity. Vital. A matter of life or death. Keep me from 
self-sabotage or great transgression. What is that? Element number five? Self can't fix it. Element number six. Understand that the lie and emotional wounding likely came in at a time that you recognized your failure. In other words, if you really wanted to cut to the quick, Holy Spirit, it's not that complicated. Where was the time that I blew it? Come on, you could do it. That's not a hard one. He will show you someplace where you blew it because probably the sabotaging of yourself or playing God to where you beat yourself came in at a time where you failed. And now you're just taking the carrot and the stick and sort of being your own rewarder and punisher. You know, the most important truth that I, I think you can get across to believers is, and, and I think they almost have to see it because it, it doesn't sink in, is I've heard preachers say, oh, forgive and forget. And, and God goes, oh, your sins are forgiven. I don't know where they went. Hey, my God's not senile. He's not having a senior moment. What he basically did was he purged, he washed, and he removed it from the written record in heaven, not the historical record. We would be so much more of a healthy church if you knew the difference between a heavenly record and a historical record. The scripture says, Abraham staggered not at the promises. Well, we have a historical record. I know a few places where he staggered. How about Acts? David is a man after my own heart who did all my will, who will do all my will. Well, wait a minute, David? Huh? The historical record is there for your instruction and reproof and correction so you don't do it again. The heavenly record is the only place it gets erased. Now, in practical Christianity, we would not have people walking in as orphans or the carrot and the stick, beating themselves, rewarding themselves according to their own pleasure, if they could recognize that once you do it properly from the heart, this is the heavenly record. When you have peace, when you receive forgiveness, when you repent, and it changes to a supernatural transaction, and it changes to peace, it is erased. You know how many people struggle up here for something that was erased legitimately? Who did that? You! Lighten up, Pharisee. Quit, quit feeding yourself carrots and sticks. Because after you beat yourself, you will find a way to comfort yourself. But it'll be a false comfort. It won't be the Holy Spirit. So quit beating yourself in the first place. Do away with the carrot and the stick. That's self-righteousness. That's being a little Pharisee. That's your own way of playing God. But when you receive forgiveness for something horrific, something you did that was horrific... That memory is not going to get erased, and nor do we do what some people don't and change the memory. That's, that's terrible. That's lying. You don't change the memory. The memory is there, but there should be no pain on the memory. And from that place of peace, you actually carry an anointing. You should be able to talk about it from the place of peace and not be upset. If you testify and you're upset while you're testifying, it's not a testimony yet. Right? What is a testimony? A testimony is something that's gone through death, burial, and resurrection. There's an anointing on it. If you are still hurting when you testify, that's not a testimony. You're basically just declaring your need because the source says there's something still on it that's hurting. That hurt needs to be removed before you have an anointing. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby I was comforted during my time of affliction. If you had never changed to comfort, then you can't offer that to anybody as an anointing or a testimony. It hasn't happened to you yet. And God's basically saying that if you could locate that failure and receive forgiveness and get it erased down here, the memory of it will be learn from it. Do what's right now. Don't let this thing torment you and come back at you and keep hammering you until you get guilty and beat yourself. 
Isn't that what people do? Living in condemnation, there's therefore now no condemnation if you're in Jesus. But that's when you're in self that you beat yourself. Now, those who fail, and this is the way I have to apply it to me. Here's the lie that's attached to the failure. The failure you feel defeated, hurt, fear, guilt, shame, whatever. But the lie that's usually attached to it is very often that those who fail deserve to be punished, including myself. If that ever gets in your head, then you're back to the carrot and the stick, and you're sabotaging your own Christian life by playing God. Can you see that? Those who fail deserve to be punished, and that includes me. If you're really spiritual, you who are spiritual, restore them. Huh? Give them the tools. I'm going to break that orphan spirit today, though. Huh? I'm loved of the Father, and so are you, right? God is our Father. I'm not going to play God. I receive forgiveness for the cross and the stick. The cross and the stick. No, I need the cross to get rid of the stick and the carrot. The carrot and the stick. Oh, Winston Churchill will be so disappointed. But I receive forgiveness for playing God in my own life, knowingly or unknowingly. Can you do that? If you're watching by Ustream. Knowingly or unknowingly, I receive forgiveness for playing God in my own life. If I struggle with any periods of condemnation, I'm involved in the carrot and the stick. I'm involved in self-righteousness. So I receive forgiveness for that because there's a loving Father that accepts me and loves me. And He's given me correction right now, but He's giving me the, a beautiful blessing of a redemptive solution. He's not there just to point at the problem. He's there to say, I want to deliver you from the carrot and the stick. I want to deliver you from yourself. And I want your righteousness to be of me, saith the Lord. And if you receive forgiveness right now and receive forgiveness for trying to live the Christian life in your own strength, I will bring peace into your spirit. And from that place of peace, I will rule. I was bought with the price I'm not my own. For years, I want to pray one more scripture with you so that you're not doing this judging other people either and you're thinking in a redemptive mindset. For years, we taught people out of Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible Translation, teaching people how to let go of stuff that don't know how to let go. Romans 14.4 is, they are God's servants not yours. They belong to him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. If you think that's your job, then you're playing God. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. After after teaching that and ministering to people, utilizing that, getting people to release their children, release all kinds of stuff, God turned it on me one day. And he said, Dennis, I want you to say that a little different. And here's what he had me do. I am God's servant, not my own. I belong to him and not to me. I'll let him tell me whether I'm right or wrong. And God is able to make me do as I should. That's what David did. He said, put me in God's, don't put me in the enemy's hands. I'd rather be in, throw myself in the mercy of God's hands. Let's do that right now. Father, right now, I just put myself in your hands. Not my enemies, not other people who think one way or another, but I release myself into your hands. I'm your servant, not mine. I belong to you and not to me. I relinquish that ownership of self. I'm responsible to you and not to me. 
and you're able to tell me whether I'm right or wrong and you're able to help me do as I should. I put myself in your hands. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hands of man, including my own. Now, let's see how responsible we are. On Tuesday, we, we taught on the I am's, particularly the three double I am's that are significantly different than all the rest of them. If you want to know, you have to come on Tuesday. Yeah. Studio Tuesday. These will not be streamed. But here, let's just answer these, these questions right now. If, so, if there's any religion in you and you feel a little response, you got something to deal with then, right? Am I responsible right now for my time, my money, Am I responsible with it right now? Am I praying regularly right now and enjoying intimacy with God? Am I surrounded with godly friends and counsel right now? Now by counsel, a lot of times it's people who are healthy because here's the pattern. Unhealthy people can find other unhealthy people and then make it feel normal. <laughs> At least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. You want to mature in the Lord, you want to enjoy the life that God has for you, hang with people that are healthy. Don't lower your standard to find people that you're better than. Big deal. I'd rather be hungry in the third grade than an expert in the second grade and a show off. You know, if you flunk enough, you could be pretty cool in any one of those grades, right, without graduating. Then what would you do? You'd say, I already knew that. But who are you impressing? Hmm? That's the carrot and the stick. Am I building strong relationships with my natural? And we're around the holidays now. This will go down good. Am I building strong relationships with natural and spiritual family? Hmm? I, natural and spiritual family. Do you know that God basically started out by saying, I placed the solitary in families, and I've also picked the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. So really, we should be responsible for wherever that is. Hmm? And you've got people coming in and out of your lives, in business, in school, in the church, what have you. You have a responsibility. That's your sphere of influence, to be all that you can be. So Father, we thank you. Am I serving in my natural and spiritual family now? If not, it's not likely to change all by itself, really. Father, put a fire under us as people to hunger and thirst for more because we're on the onset of a powerful awakening and there will be a, a divergent groups, one drawing closer to God and the other one looking for the status quo, the familiar, and call it safe. Seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Cause us to quit shooting ourselves in the foot. Rewarding and punishing ourselves has no merit nor value. And we receive forgiveness for doing that. And we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.